So in this video now, we're going to break down what DSSD, the method, the formula that I've been talking about. Now, this is a way better depiction of that formula, of that method than what I was doing before, my, my scribble. Well, I hope it was clear for you and you did understand it. This is really, uh, I guess, the process now with, with regard to how to apply this formula to this problem that you have, which is, of course, creating and choosing the right business and then having it distributed. And for me to explain this, I'm going to break down now um, how, you, how you look at the deal, how you look at the structure, scalability, and how you distribute. But instead of me using an example from the big wide world out there, this, you know, a big company who's done it perfectly right. Um, and, and, and really what I'd love to do is actually, you know, take, give, give examples that are more relevant to you. If I could, I would. Um, and I'm certainly sure that we'll create some live sessions soon where I can actually certain, where I can actually do, do that and work with you. But for this, I'm going to focus on, um, my own business. I'm going to use my own company as a case study and I'm going to walk you through how I structured the deal how I structured, how I looked at the structure, make sure it was applicable, whether or not it was scalable and how I distribute it. So I'm gonna really break that down now. So, oh, and before I start, let's go right back here. As you can see, the way this is designed, much like a formula, right? You look at those complex formulas, all the different squiggles and numbers. Fact is you don't just, you know, dump numbers all over it. There's a starting point to a formula, right? And then there's, and there's also an end. Okay, so there's a beginning and then there's an end. And when you get to the end, that's the result you're hoping for. Much the same, much, much, in much is the same way this works. Um, you start with your deal. You want to make sure that the deal's right. Okay. And if it is, and you've got a check mark, you move on. If not, you stick back there. You really need to spend time figuring out your deal. Now, most people do get stuck here. Most, do, most people do this really well. They, they obsess over an idea. They obsess over something that they think is going to be good in the market, useful in the market, can deliver against promises. But that's pretty much where they stay. They never really take action. The next st stage is, of course, structure, which is, of course, once you've got your deal, it's how is it going to be? How are you going to basically execute against the, the, the premise of this idea, the beginning, the, the fundamentals of it? How would you basically make this a reality? Some people get here too, which is great. But then you move on to scalability. This is the real question that you'll find, you know, people throw around in Shark Tank and various other types of entrepreneurial shows is can it scale to greatness? Can people, are, is it, is it going to be a one time deal? Is it going to be a fad? Is it going to be a trend? Is it going to be a growth market situation? Are you in a stable market? There is, is there enough of a market there available to buy it? Do you have enough of it to sell? These are all good questions. And I'm not saying that they have to be anything other than your plan, like I said to you before, you can sell fads. Fads are great because they make a lot of money quick and they disappear off. But you, as long as you capitalize in that situation, you've, 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 you're winning, you've won. Um, so as long as you have your plan, you'll be able to do fine here. So you want to make sure scalability is there. And if, got, if of course you haven't figured it out, then stick with it and keep reevaluating your previous sections before you move on because distribution is really where you tie all of these elements in and you basically deliver this almost like a sales pitch as a plan to the people that you're going to work with to help you sell it. So let's show you how I did this with my company. And of course, the company I'm going to use is USPI, my private equity business that focuses on parking lots, US parking investments. So let's start there. <laughs> so what was the deal? You know, that's the first thing you have to look at when you're looking at deals. So I'll go through these questions first, and then I'll give you my case study example. So what is the deal? What are you trying to sell? What What is your concept? What is this idea that you have? Is it attractive and does it offer someone or that person real value? You know, you want to make sure that it is. Is it what your buyers and importantly, your distributors need or want? Do, your, do the people that you're trying to have sell this for you need it? Do they want to sell it? It's not just your end user customers. You've got to take into consideration both here. Is there a market and can it deliver on its promises? Super, super important. I'm going to highlight, can it deliver on its promises? This is really something that you want to make sure that you do properly with any, any product, any service. Sometimes you have great ideas, but in actually delivering against them, you fall foul and businesses die every day just because of that thing alone. You want to make sure that whatever you create, as far as this deal is concerned, you can deliver against what you promise. So with regard to the parking lot that I was 
the first parking lot that I was structuring for this private equity company. Well, the thing about parking lots, right? I do love them for, and I've said this earlier in the course, for four main reasons. The fact that it's real estate and what happens with real estate. Real estate goes up in value over time and it's resilient to recessions and that sort of thing. It can take a dip, but it recovers typically, right? As long as it's in a good, stable economy. So number one is the real estate aspect. The second is the fact that you, you've got, um, it's cash flowing every single day. So you know, parking lots, they take in cash every day and we never really have a problem collecting rent because if people don't pay for their parked car, they don't get their car, right? So it's cash, it cash flows daily, so that's always good in the balance sheet. Third situ the third benefit to it is the fact that it's price elastic. Parking prices in the US are not regulated, which means I can charge $20 today, tomorrow I can charge 25. It's really up to me and as a customer, you either choose to do it or you're not. And of course, most cases people are, you know, they just park anyway because they've already had to make that decision prior to getting to the parking lot. They're having or they're willing to spend the money on it. So you can change it. So it's a bit sharky in terms of shark tactics are concerned, but parking lots are good in that sense. And of course, um, so that's price elastic. And of course, it tracks inflation too. You know, so if the, the fact is, if the price of milk goes up tomorrow, if we do walk into this recession, as we, you know, everyone keeps talking about, and of course, you know, we do have recessions. And when that happens, we can drop or increase prices as necessary. But we're stabilizing the fact that the real estate itself is always going to climb in value. So it's a lot of good reasons why I liked parking. So that was the deal. The deal was parking. Um, is it attractive and does it offer real value? Well, it definitely offers real value, but I don't know how attractive parking lots were. I mean, bear in mind, this is an investment class and I'm competing against really swanky, fancy hotel investments and the stock markets and these annuities and all these other types of investments out there. Parking lots just aren't that sexy. And the fact is, I had a couple of things here, but I knew it offered real value. And is it what my buyers are distributed once and are needed? Well, I believe so. The fact was, uh, my buyers wanted something stable, nothing fancy. Parking lots are what they are. We need them. We drive cars. In, in the US, I think there was a statistic I saw uh, where 96% of the population drives over the age of 16. That is a huge amount of people on the road. And of course, if you're on the road, you're going to have to park your car at some point. It's kind of like knives and forks to your plates. You just have to have a parking space for the car that you drive. So. Does it, is it something they need or want? Maybe not what they want, but definitely what they need. They need something stable that can weather the, weather the storm. And of course, is there a market for it? Well, yes, there is. People do want to safeguard their capital. They want to pull money out of the marketplace. The stocks and shares of this world are sometimes too crazy to look at, even if you haven't got money in there. So a nice place to diversify is into real estate. And of course, parking is real estate. So it's a good place to park some money. No pun intended. So that was my my evaluation of the deal. So I had my little checkbox here, like, okay, I think I've got the deal right. Let's move on. Let's look at the structure. Now, again, I'm gonna go through the questions first and then I'll give you the case study. Is it already structured right or can it be restructured to suit your needs? Think about that because if you're selling someone else's product or company, um, you're looking at whatever it is that they're selling. Let's say you are selling something in the fitness space, like that example of uh, my, that buddy of mine who was my personal trainer who then became a businessman in the fitness arena selling pre-workout shakes and all the various other types of health and fitness supplements that he had going. Um, was it structured right? Well, it was structured right. It, he had a market for it. And as far as pricing was concerned, there was a good markup. He could buy this thing in bulk. He could be anywhere between eight and twelve dollars per tub that he was selling, and he'd be selling them for forty to fifty dollars. So he was making. There was enough of a, uh, of a, as far as financially, as far as the profit margins were concerned, it was structured right. So we didn't have to restructure it. But that's something that you want to look at with your own business too. Are you priced correctly to strategically target the mass market? Well, if it was two, let's say it was north of fifty dollars, it was like sixty or seventy. I don't think he would have had the success. He had to have that sweet spot in terms of pricing. Pricing really is key. And we're going to be actually looking at pricing uh, significantly in some later modules here because that is a very very important factor to, to to pull into this because you want to make sure your pricing is right. Otherwise, if it's not right. A, you might not get the customers. If it's too cheap, you're not going to make any money or you can't get anyone to help sell it for you because there's nothing there to pay them. So that's important for you. Is it too high? Is it too low for your audience? What are the production costs, the profit margin, and are there legal ramifications? Well, 
Let's go back to my parking investments. Is it already structured right? No. It's a parking lot, but I now have to restructure it to suit uh, so I can sell it as an investment because we're a private equity company. So I have to get involved with completely restructuring uh, from a contract point of view, from a, a, a legal point of view to make sure I'm not breaking any laws. I had to restructure the project so that I could sell it in the way that I wanted to sell it, which is as an investment to potential investors. Was it priced correctly? Well, I didn't want to sell the entire parking lot because they were priced between some as low as $2 million all the way up to $22 million in Manhattan. So $2 million for the obscure parking lot in the uh, smaller city outside uh, in, in sort of southern Southern America, South of, not South America, but just the southern uh, states. And uh, then you have really expensive Manhattan, Los Angeles, San Francisco, where you, huge, huge inflation in price. Um, so how was I going to be able to sell this to an audience uh, as as a new concept, something that isn't immediately as attractive, right? Because remember, I'm competing against hotel investments and all these other fantastically uh, fantastic stock options out there. Um, I now had to make this attractive. So what I did was instead of selling the whole parking lot at 20 million or 2 million or 5 million, I actually sold the individual parking spaces at a price point between 20 to 20, 20 to 35,000, depending on where it was. So each individual parking space at 20 to 35,000, that would give the investor a piece of real land. They own a piece of, a piece of land that is going up in value. And that as people are using this parking lot, they are getting a portion of that as a return. They're getting money paid to them. It's paying, it's almost like passive income. Well, it is passive income and they own land. So that's good. It's paying them while they own land. It goes up in value and it's very easy exit options in the end. So. That was the audience I was tapping into. I needed to get the people who were buying or considering purchasing 500 to a million dollars worth of commercial real estate or residential real estate. And that this would be the thing that they would either test the waters on or diversify into. So it had to be low enough for them to be attracted to it. What are the production costs? Well, I mentioned how expensive they are, right? I had to buy them. What are the profit margins? Well, I had to create a profit margin. So if I was securitizing it, which is what I was doing, I was creating an investment around it. So if this is a $2 million parking lot and it's doing $500 to $600,000 a year, and I'm now going to chop it up into little bite-sized pieces for investors to come buy into, and I'm going to equally portion off a couple, uh, 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 let's say 60 to 70% of that, um, of that revenue after expenses, that, that, that net profit. Um, and spend and, and send that out to our investors. Uh, that you know there has to be enough of a profit margin so I can increase the price point by at least thirty percent because I'm selling that service. But for me to do that, of course, I have to have or cover all my my legal ramifications, which of course in the U.S. you should know uh, it is the SEC that you have to comply with, and there's a lot of work that you've got to do there. So this is a very expensive example. But it is my my example. It's my real case study. I had to spend over one hundred and one hundred and twenty thousand dollars just on setting this entire thing up, and that was with me talking to lawyers and figuring out how we could dissect and chop up a parking lot and have it sold in this way, onshore in the U.S. and offshore. So the contracts around the whole thing. Um, and I'm actually going to go into there's actually a, a module that I'm going to create, which is just about how to set up a private equity company. I mean, it doesn't cost $120,000 to set up a private equity company or set up a fund. That's just how much it cost me because I had to figure out how to do it. And when you talk to lawyers, they can take you right down the garden path and around the bushes. You don't even know what's happening before you know it. You're just getting billed every month. So I'll explain through my own experiences how we did that. But that was how I structured my deal. So think about your own business. Think about how you're going to structure. Think about the audience, the price points. Think about the, whether or not there's big enough margin there. And of course, of course, of course, you must, must, must think about the legal ramifications. It doesn't just surround investments. You have to think, think about food and drink as well if you're selling that kind of thing, especially if it's onshore, if you're selling overseas in other territories. You must consider those things. Very, very important. Scalability. Okay. Can there... <laughs> Can it be sold in huge quantities, right? Is there enough of a market out there? I say this all the time. Make sure that there is. You don't want to have this this cool product that no one wants. Okay. I think we've all seen that in well examples all around us. I know that there were some MP3 players that were really trying to gain traction before the Apple iPod came into play, and Apple just destroyed everyone. Then there were people, companies trying to trying to creep back up. I think it was the um, 
the Microsoft Zune, Google that one, had no chance in hell. Uh, they didn't have the market for it. They weren't able to do it. So really assess your scalability. We will, of course, break down how to do that later on in this module, but it's a standardized business practice. You want to make sure that there is a market there and that there's enough of it that can be sold. And of course, can you create it? Can production scale up to match demand? Can you create enough of it quick enough to match demand? And of course, is there a margin? And that kind of relates back to structure, but you've got to be able to, as far as scalability is concerned, how much of that margin are you willing to give away? So in structure, you've got to be able to have a margin, which is right here. But in the scalability, it's deciding on how much you're going to pay. So now let's bring it back to my case study, right? So can it be sold in huge quantities as far as my parking lots are concerned? Well, if the demand starts picking up, well, there's plenty of parking lots. I mean, we've been driving cars for a long time. Just think in your own mind's eye of how many parking lots you know in your local area, and then Google map how many there are, and you'll be astonished. There's a lot of them, typically, for the most part. There's a hell of a lot of parking spaces out there. So if so, I can definitely sell it in huge quantities provided there's a market for them. And of course, if my price point picks up and people love the idea of buying these bite-sized investments for 25, 30 grand, I could really have that scale. What are my cost implications and my price point? Well, my price point would have to be significantly higher, not significantly, but a decent chunk higher than what I buy the place at. If I buy a place for $2 million, I want 30% markup on that. Why? Because this, is, this comes into the margin that I'm allowing others to sell it for me. I want to be able to give it away at least 10%, so above the com competitor's rate. So if competitors in typical traditional real estate investments are paying out between six, sometimes 8% at max, I want to be in the 12, 10 to 12% range where I really get their attention because they can be earning a lot more money with me selling my products. So I had to make sure that my margins were right. And can production scale up to demand? Well, like I say, there's a lot of parking lots already out there. They're pre-existing. So I can go and if, if I'm making my margins as I'm expecting to, every time I complete a project, I can just shift, buy up another project and keep on going. So that's my scalability with my scalability options with, uh, with the parking market, with, with my business. Now, as far as distribution is concerned, if you've got everything right as far as the deal, you're comfortable with it. You've got your structure right. You're comfortable with it. You think this is right. You've done your research. You've done your business plan, essentially. You've thought about scale, the potential for great success, the potential for average success, the potential for failure. You've looked at your scalability options. Now you're going to think about who you can recruit to help you sell it fast. Okay. So what are your adoption challenges in rolling out your offer? What does adoption challenges mean? Like, is it something that another person can sell legally? Like my investments, and I'll go into that. Can someone else just sell it for you or are they gonna to have to be qualified or will have to be a certain type of business to be able to do that for you? Uh, are you selling in different countries? Is there a language barrier? Is there different laws that you now need to comply with with other, with other countries? Think about all those things that will stop people from adopting <laughs> you, your, your offering. What are the barriers? And this kind of rolls into the same thing. What are the actual barriers? Now that could be, again, like I say, le legal ramifications. It could be competitors in the marketplace. Consider your competition, the threat of new entrants. You, if you're, this is your first go, then you are the new entrant. Are, is there really big competition there? Are they capable of shutting you down? How would your, your distribution network navigate around that? And who are you gonna choose as your distribution network? Who are you gonna choose to work with you? All right, so you, 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 you want to have as many companies working with you as possible, right? So you want to start off with just one man bands, the, in, the influencers out there perhaps, but then you want small businesses that you can, you know, you want to have 10, 20, 30, 50 of these companies that are all backing you that are relevant to your marketplace. But then equally, you also want to have the main producers for your business too, the big companies that you're just looking to get involved with. And I will tap into how to get your distributors later on as well, because that's a bit of an art. And there's, there's, there's some strategies that you can put in play to help you achieve, uh, to help you get as many distributors on board as possible. But that's a really important factor. It's what's going to stop you and who can you get to sell it for you? You've got to consider these things when it comes to your distribution. Now, with my, like I say, my parking investment company, 
my adoption challenges, first of all, one of the biggest factors for adoption was they didn't like the idea of it. It just wasn't sexy. It's parking. So I really had to, my challenge at first was to convince them that, hey, real estate as parking is a really good investment. It cash flows all the time. It tracks inflation. It's price elastic. It's great. Um, but that was the first thing I had. And then, of course, I had all the legal ramifications. Well, if I'm talking to a company in another country, they have to apply and uh, abide by their local securities laws, their local investment laws. So I might be all wrapped up like a perfectly regulated and compliant here in the US. But then if they sold it there, they wouldn't be compliant in their own country. So we had to work out how companies could work with us. And we had to do a lot there as far as paperwork, really. It's just lawyers and paying them to create contracts to find ways in which other people can now be working with you. The barriers. Of course, we had the language barriers. I had to translate everything. I had to figure out how I could have this written in Arabic. I had to have it written in Spanish for South America. I had to have it written in, Fran in French for France. I had to have it written um, in Chinese, at mainland China, so I could sell it out there. There was a lot that we had to do when it came to uh, working with the barriers of actually rolling this out. There. So it wasn't just one website we needed. We needed a website that could be translated in multiple different languages and information that could be doing the same as well. So there was certainly that for us. Um, and who were we going to embed in our distribution channel? Well, I couldn't very well go to the biggest uh, investment companies out there, like, or, you know, the biggest funds out there, the hedge fund. They wouldn't look at this. I had to be very selective who I was going to work with. I had to work with the smaller, more localized real estate investment firms that sat in these countries. The companies that were raising capital to the extent like 2 million, 5 million for like small projects, local projects, like multifamily buildings here and there, or a commercial real estate entity. Perhaps it was land that was being set up to be a restaurant that would be a triple net lease for McDonald's or something. <laughs> it, it was it was a smaller commercial real estate investment companies that I was looking for. So we had to really think think of who we were going to embed in our distribution channel and be selective as to who they were going to be too. And they had to be, of course, they had to be compliant with the laws as well in our, with, with the US and of course in their, in their domicile country too. And who was going to be the main producers of the business? So we had all these ideas of who, who's relevant as distributors. We want a, a certain level of relevancy. And then there's also those golden nuggets. There's the ones that you know can deliver. And so we had to target those companies as far as distributors are concerned. If we don't get them immediately, we have to show some track record, but we're going to get them eventually. So we have to use all these other distributors. We have all this combined marketing. We have all these investors singing up, singing us praise. We want to have so that we can get the attention of our main producers because they're the ones who are going to really shift us into the stratosphere as far as being able to raise capital is concerned. So that was my plan with setting up this or preparing uh, to distribute against that private equity model. And it's a very, very, you know, you, if I, whenever I explain this to the, 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 the everyday run of the mill private equity company, the small one, th this to them is completely foreign in the way that we structured this. It's this, you know, they typically have to just work with friends and family, people in business, uh, people that they can find out through their network of contacts of investors. They kind of have had to go through the humdrum of having gone to a you know investment bank career and come out of it to then set up their own shop and hopefully have some contacts that they can use because you know it's the, you, you think there's how how many people do you know that have a lot of money that would buy into an idea of yours so this was my workaround this is the real this is a real world hack <laughs> this is a real world fundraising hack that i had to figure out is i use distribution networks i created excitement by having all these things in play, I created excitement. I, I created rationale, a, a certain logic that could be applied to this product that I was offering. And I got people behind it. And they were experts in their field. And they could tap into the small to the small investor. And that's how we built it. We had to think outside the box. And this method really does help you do that. So this is my breakdown of how I've obviously my own case study with my own business. I want you to go ahead and do exactly the same thing. Go through this video again and go through each question and apply it to your product or service. You really need to. And if you don't get the answer straight away, just like that formula, that mathematical formula, this is your formula. You can go through it and get it wrong. That's okay. All it means is you've got to go back and just go through it again until you get it right. Don't execute, 
without going through this. As if you've got green ticks everywhere, then you're good, you're good to go. And then we're going to talk about next is once you're good to go, is how to basically deploy this, your first steps. What are you going to do immediately when you've basically got to this point where you're saying, yeah, I've got it. I'm happy. I'm ready to go. So that's what we're going to do next.